Amen. Well, congregation, for our scripture text this evening, uh, you may turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus t- chapter 20, just one verse for right now. Uh, but you won't, will want to keep your Bibles handy because we're going to be looking at a number of passages from the New Testament. Exodus 20, verse 12, and you can find that in most of the Pew Bibles on page 74. <clears throat> In our study of the Catechism tonight, we are going through, of course, the Ten Commandments and the Catechism's application of it, and uh, this evening we're looking at the Fifth Commandment, a commandment which has fallen on hard times as it calls for obedience, not only to parents, but also, as I hope to show you in a few few moments, uh, to all those in lawful authority over us. So we're going to read that one verse, and then we're going to turn to the Catechism, but as I said, we're going to be looking at a few other passages later on in the sermon. So here now the reading of God's holy word from Exodus 20, verse 12. This this is the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And then turn at this time in your forms and prayers book. Turn to page 246. Page 246, just one question and answer for our attention this evening on the bottom of page 246, looking at Lord's Day 39. As always, I will read the question, and together as God's people, we will respond with the answer. Question 104 asks us the following this evening, what is God's will for you in the fifth commandment? that I show honor, love, and faithfulness to my father and mother and all those in authority over me. Submit myself with proper obedience to all their good teaching and discipline, and also that I be patient with their failings, for by their hand God wills to rule us. It is our confession this evening. As always, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit. Let's ask for His illuminating grace as we come to Him this evening. Our God and our Father, as we sung just moments ago, nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be Thine. Sin with its follies, I gladly resign. Father, that is the, the heart cry of Your children tonight. Father, we know because Your Spirit has exposed our hearts that we are prone to wander, prone to sin, prone to rebellion against parents and those in authority over us. And we pray, O Lord, tonight that you would work powerfully through your word. We ask, Lord, that your spirit now would teach us uh, the application of this commandment. We pray that he would give us the right truth from your word. And and Father, we pray that he would write its truth upon our hearts, that we would not only uh, see our sin and repent of it, but Father, tonight that we would see Christ in his fulfillment of all of this law and that we would rest in him And even more than that, Father, that we would see the blessing of godly parents. And uh, we we ask all of this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, I think we would all agree, or most of us would agree, that when you're going to someplace new, it's uh, it's always helpful to have someone who's been there before go along with you. Uh, When I think of that, I think about driving to some busy city or some downtown area. Uh, Perhaps you may like downtown areas, but I, for one, uh, don't enjoy downtown. I always feel nervous going in all those busy streets, trying to find all the right turns, going through the the highways and making sure you're getting off on the right exit. And anytime I'm going to a big city, it's always an an extra encouragement or comfort. If someone is driving or if I'm going with them, or if they're coming with me, rather, and uh, they know where to go. Uh, They know where to turn off. They know where the parking garage is. They know all the locations because that means... Uh, they're going to assist me in areas where I have never been before. And uh, it may be as simple as well as going to a new restaurant with someone who's been there before. Of course, where no one is scared to go to a restaurant. But if someone has been there before, they can recommend what's on the menu. They know what to expect. Uh, It's always helpful to go to someplace new with someone who's been there before. 
And that's exactly what the fifth commandment really is all about. Tonight, as we come to think about parents and the command to honor parents, and even those in authority over us, that's what I want to instill in our study of this commandment. That parents are a blessing because they've been there before. That parents are a blessing that we are called to honor. We are called to obey parents in the Lord because they are those who are to take our hands there, to come along our sides. They are to walk with us through life, especially in our younger years. And they are to guide us and be blessed advisors because they have been there before. Uh, And on the one hand, we get this just from a practical daily existence. Parents are far older than us. They have lived life lessons. So just on a practical level, parents are a blessing because they can help us make choices and help us avoid painful experiences that perhaps they have learned the lesson of. But the fifth commandment goes far deeper than that. The fifth commandment has in mind even the spiritual blessings of being discipled by godly parents who have walked with Christ, have followed after Him, and you see the blessing of the fifth commandment is far greater than just worldly wisdom. It is spiritual blessing because godly parents know what it is to follow Christ. They know the struggles with sin. They know the the blessings of Christ. And therefore, we are called to honor parents because of the extreme blessing they are as they teach us to follow after God and after our Savior. And so tonight, as we come to the fifth commandment, that's the emphasis I want to put on it. Uh, As we've been noting the last couple of weeks in this go-round of studying the commandments, I want to emphasize the gracious nature of the law. We've been noting over and over that the law comes to God's people in the context of redemption. Yes, the law convicts us of sin. Yes, the law points us to Christ. But the law is given primarily as a way to show blessing how we live a life of gratitude in response to the God who has redeemed us. And tonight, parents and children alike have a lesson to learn on how we are a blessing in light of living in covenant community. And it's striking that God speaks really to covenant children in this passage and says, to covenant children, I have blessed you with parents, therefore you honor me by honoring those I put over you. And so that is our goal tonight, to see the blessing of godly parents. Here's the theme that I want to consider with you this evening. We learned tonight that God has gifted parents to covenant children to be guides in life. God has gifted parents to covenant children to be guides in life. And there are three points that I want to get at or use to get at that theme. First of all, I want to consider the principles of the command. I want to go into uh, the fifth commandment and really understand what it is commanding us to do. Secondly, I want to look at the parameters of the command. What does this mean for the godly household? And actually, I want to go even broader than that. What does this mean for all those who have been given authority over us? And then lastly, and thirdly, I want to look at the promise of the command. And this is really where I want to spend most of the time here tonight, noting the blessing and the promise of the command and how parents are called to be that blessing to their children. So the principles, the parameters, and then thirdly, the promise of this command. So first of all then, what are the principles of this command? And the first thing we need to note, as we always do when we come to the fifth commandment, is really to note that the right way, or the the first thing to note about this commandment, is the, the proper placement of it. The fifth commandment has been placed in the midst of the ten commandments at a very unique place, because in this command we both obey God and man. Uh, If you remember a number of weeks ago when the the Heidelberg Catechism was beginning to expound the commandments, the the Heidelberg Catechism notes that the law is divided in two tables. Commandments one through four are focused on the obedience and a relationship that we owe unto God. And we've seen that the last four commandments that we have studied. That we are to worship God alone. That we are to view His name as holy. We're to honor Him by keeping His Sabbath day holy. All of the first four commandments have a vertical focus on our relationship with God. But then commandments 5 through 10 really begin to shift in our focus of the duty that we owe to our fellow man, the horizontal relationships that we have with people here that we live with. The fifth commandment, interestingly, has an aspect of both. The fifth commandment tells us tonight that we are to relate to our parents, we relate, relate to those in authority over us by giving unto them proper honor and obedience. 
But interestingly, we honor God as we do that. In other words, my point here tonight, if I haven't confused you, is that the fifth commandment teaches that God has given delegated authorities in our life. That God has given parents to represent His authority to the children in the home. And therefore, as children obey their parents, they're actually obeying God. When children obey and honor their parents, they're actually honoring God through that delegated authority. So the fifth commandment teaches us both the honor we owe to God and the honor that we owe to parents and those in authority over us. But notice the commandment's command here tonight is a command to honor. Again, the commandment says this, the first half of it, is to honor, God says, honor your father and your mother. Now the first question we need to ask tonight is what does that word honor mean? And that honor, the word honor in Hebrew means something that is heavy, uh, something that is weighty, something that is glorious, something that is to be viewed as substantial. In fact, actually the word kavod is used for God. It is used for His glory in the tabernacle and the temple. It is the weightiness of who God is. And it's used here now in connection with parents. God says, listen, you're to view your parents with a respect and awe, a reverence and a weightiness that is a reflection of the reverence and awe and weightiness that you view me. Again, you see the principle here. God is to be worshipped and revered above all. And since his parents, our parents represent him to us, we are to reflect that with an honor and a reverence and a weightiness to how we interact with our parents. Uh, we saw this a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the third commandment, when we looked at God's name. We were to not misuse God's name. And there we saw that we were to use uh, to misuse God's name is to treat it as a light thing. We noted that God is to be treated with a, a weightiness, a reverence, and an awe. And again, that is exactly what children are commanded to do to their parents. And so the commandment here tonight is very clear. That to anyone who has been given a God-delegated authority, we are to respond to with a reverence and awe. We are to treat them with an honor that is due to them because God has delegated that authority on his behalf through them. And that is the point tonight. The principle of the command is to honor those with authority, especially parents in our lives. Now, of course, in a few moments I'll mention this again, but since this is a delegated authority, we're reminded that any time either a parent or some other authority who rules on God's behalf would tell us to do anything contrary to God's law, we, of course, are duty-bound to disobey them. We must uh, do what God says rather than man. But anytime there's an authority that represents God's will appropriately, we are to respect that authority and render to them a weightiness since they come to us from God himself. So that's the first thing to note. The principle tonight is a weightiness and honor given to those in authority over us. Now secondly though, what does that look like? We'd say, okay, pastor, we get that. There's an honor that we owe. We must speak appropriately. We must do all of this. But how does that play itself out practically in the parameters of my life? And to that, I want to turn to the New Testament to see how Paul applies this commandment to a couple aspects of our life. If you have your Bibles open, turn to Ephesians 6 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, applying the gospel, applying the truth of God's word. And to the end of the letter now, he is writing to heads of household and writing to uh, those within a household setting for how the gospel transforms how they live. Earlier in chapter 5, he wrote to how husbands and wives are to relate to one another. But let's begin, first of all, with parents and children. How does the fifth commandment play itself out in our lives. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Paul, speaking to the children in Ephesus, says the following, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Paul writing in the New Testament context, he's writing to predominantly Gentiles here in Ephesus, and he says, children, the fifth commandment is still in play. Children, little baptized members of the church in Ephesus, 
Since you are God's covenant children, you are called now to make application in your day-to-day life as you live with your parents in the home. You are to obey your parents. Now notice what Paul says. How are you to obey your parents? Paul says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Paul says the application of the fifth commandment to children, to Christians in Ephesus, is you are to obey your parents and that obedience is as to be done as unto the Lord. Again, you see, Paul is rightly applying the commandment. Parents in Ephesus have been delegated by Christ himself to be covenant heads and covenant parents to these covenant children. And Paul says, baptized children, you obey Christ in how you obey your parents parents. You honor them by how you respect the authority God has given to them, and you demonstrate that practically by how you obey them as they guide you in the home. And the the implication is obvious. You notice that if their commandments, if what parents are telling their children to do is fitting according to God's word, not contrary to it, obedience is not an option. Obedience is to be rendered because as covenant children, They're obeying their Father, they're obeying their Savior through this commandment by obeying their parents. But you notice the application doesn't end there. And I would actually argue the application gets even weightier now with parents. You notice what Paul says in verse 4. Paul says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Paul says, now I have a word of application to parents. And notice, not just father and mother, but Paul calls out covenant heads of homes And he says, listen, parents, particularly fathers, you are to exercise this God-given authority in such a way that God exercises it in your life. Yes, children are called to obey. Yes, they are to honor you. But parents, I have delegated my authority. And how you use that authority must reflect the gracious, the tender, compassionate care that I give to you. Notice, Paul is very concerned that fathers not abuse their authority, but treat their children in a fatherly, Christ-like way that God God the Father has done to them. And so Paul says, fathers, be very careful. In moments of exasperation, be very careful. Parenting can be a very frustrating thing, but fathers, remember how gracious your father has been to you. Remember how compassionate he's been to you, even in his discipline. So fathers, parents, Instruct your children, exercise the authority in a way that properly demonstrates how I treat you. And there's a weightiness to this, isn't it, parents? There's a weightiness to this because in many ways what Paul is teaching us is that that in our younger years of our children, there's a sense in which our children see Christ through us. How we live, how we act is meant to be the reflection of proper, reflection of Christ, or maybe a skewed reflection if we should be disobedient to this commandment. And we are too, as parents and as fathers, we are positively to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The exercise of God's authority is for the sole purpose of walking hand in hand hand with our children, opening the word with our children, and walking with them and taking them by the hand so they follow after Christ themselves. The use of this authority is to lead them as guides after their Savior. So that's the first thing the New Testament teaches us by way of application. The parameters is to reflect the glory and the love of Christ in the home. But it doesn't end there. That would be enough as it were tonight. We could almost end the sermon there and already find ourselves convicted. But we know that there's more to this. Interestingly, the New Testament tells us that the fifth commandment has broader applications. The reason I wanted to go to Ephesians is because this is one other passage. Notice Paul is not done with the fifth commandment. Look again at chapter 6, verse 5. Paul, writing again to uh, households, writes this. He says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism 
with them. Now we need to make a brief note here that when Paul is writing to slaves in the the Roman culture, the Roman Empire, slavery had a, a wide swath of application, both with abusive slaves and slaves really being almost as children. But be that as it may, Paul is writing to households of where there were household servants who were living in the home, and many of them, no doubt, converted by the masters in the home. And Paul says, listen, the fifth commandment has an application to you. You are to work heartily as unto the Lord, and masters, you are to exercise your authority in reflection of God's tender compassion. Now, I would say the application for us today, since thankfully we don't live in a culture where there is such an institution as slavery and masters, we can apply this to employees and employers. Employees are called to honor their employers and to work heartily unto, or work heartily for them, as unto the Lord. You notice what Paul says, slaves obey your masters as you would obey Christ. What is Paul saying? Paul says, think of the fifth commandment. Who has God put over you? He's put over your, your boss, your employee, or your employer. And you are to work heartily as if you were working directly for Christ. You are to do your job Monday through Friday, maybe Monday through Saturday, Saturday, whatever the case may be. You are to be diligent, clocking in, being faithful with your hours. Why? Because you are doing that as unto the Lord. There's a delegated sense of authority, and you are to do that with that sense. Keep it in, working for an honest wage with your honest hours and doing it as unto the Lord. And again, you notice Paul has a word of application from the fifth commandment to masters, to those who have an authority, in this case, employers, you are to be considerate in how you wield this or how you exercise this God-given authority. You are to be compassionate, Paul says. You are to be considerate with those. You are to reflect the care, the comfort, and, and the whole aspect of Christ. You are to exercise this in such a way that your employees see Christ in you. You are to do this in such a way, not with harsh and threatening language, but with a consideration to their needs, why? Because you represent Christ, you represent God to them and how you exercise that authority. So the fifth commandment has broader applications with our jobs. One more that I wanna do, no, turn to Romans 13. You know I would turn here, Romans 13. Uh, you can find that on page uh, 1101. If it were not enough to have a- application for parents and children, but we're not enough to have application for employees and employers. Notice that Paul says the fifth commandment also applies to our government. Romans 13, Paul is writing in the context, of course, of the Roman government, and listen to how he applies the fifth commandment to the church in Rome. Romans 13, verse 1, says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For the ruler holds no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on, punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of pos- possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, says, listen, the fifth commandment also takes place in how you live in relation to proper governing authorities, legitimate government authorities, that have been placed over you. You notice Paul goes over and over and says that God himself has established these governments. God has put these rulers in authority over you. In fact, he goes so far in this passage to actually say that the ruling authorities are God's servants that they are God's servants to punish wrongdoers. They are to be blessings to their people by by restraining wicked, by restraining evil doing. And Paul says, when they're doing that properly, you are to submit to them because I have put them over you. Now again, we need to make very clear here that any time a governing authority would ever command us to do anything contrary to God's word, or any time they go outside the bounds of which God had given to them, we as a church are duty-bound, of course, to uh, humbly disobey that. 
But when they are properly doing what God has given them to do, we as Christians are to show proper obedience, proper honor unto them when they are fulfilling God's will and how they rule and what God has called them to do. And so the point tonight is this, the parameters of the fifth commandment spill over even into how we think, how we speak, and how we respect those in authority over us. Now, in many ways, I almost thought about preaching all on Romans 13 because there's much more we could say about this. Clearly, we are called to to properly point out where our leaders are ruling us wrongly, where they're disobeying God's command, but we are to respect them insofar as they are properly carrying out their duties. Why? Because they've been given that authority from God Himself. God has delegated that place to them, and Christians testify unto God in many ways by how we do this. And I would even say as Christians in, in this, this instant clickbait culture of rage when parties are, are, are posting things just to get a view, in many ways by how we speak about our rulers and how we show this actually testifies in many ways glory unto our Savior. But what's the point tonight? What do we mean by the parameters of the fifth commandment? Here's what I hope you see from this. Is that the fifth commandment is not just to children and parents, but it's to every lawful authority God has put over us. We could turn to passages about church leaders. We could think of uh, the application of teachers and how teachers over their students are a proper authority uh, and all of these things. But the point is, the fifth commandment says God has delegated authority and therefore to those properly exercising that, we are to submit and obey as unto the Lord. And so there's a wide range in the parameters of our life. Now, thirdly, though, and finally, the last thing I want to consider with you now is the promise that God gives in this command. What is the joy of this? Or the question that I asked all week long in light of trying to emphasize the graciousness to us uh, as we study the law, why does this commandment bring blessing to the church? Why is this commandment a blessing to the household? Well, go back to Exodus 20 or just listen to the promise. I want to flesh out this promise that God gives in Exodus 20. Paul, or God says, honor your father and your mother. Why? So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. What is the promise of this commandment? What is the blessing of this commandment? God says the blessing is that you will dwell in their land in my presence and I with you for a long time. What is the background to this command? I'll be reminded that God gave this to Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness, as they were preparing to enter the promised land, as God was establishing Israel in the land of Canaan to be a tiny reflection of Eden. God had given the promised land uh, as a, a way of giving a tiny glimpse of what it is to live with the holy God. And in the law, God says, when I give you the land, you are to live in such a way that reflects walking in a relationship with me. You continue reading in De- Deuteronomy and Leviticus, God over and over has laws that were to be instituted when they entered the land because God says, I'm a holy God. And as you live in the land, you're living with me. Therefore, you are to be a holy people. And so over and over in the Old Testament, and especially in the Old Testament law, God says there is a requirement that you are to walk before me living by faith. Israel was to live before God by repenting of their sin, by trusting in his gracious promise of forgiveness through the sacrifices and... They were to flee from sin and live holy lives in obedience to the law before them. And what is interesting, over and over, God says, if you do not do this, I will spit you out of the land. If you turn your back on me, if you forget me, if you no longer follow my ways and you continue to walk after the gods of the nations around you, if you no longer walk differently, then I'm going to send a foreign nation and I'm going to remove you from this land as a punishment to all the watching world that I am a holy God and I am to be followed in such a way. And God writing in the law says now to children, listen, how do you not lose the privilege of the land? How do you not get spit out of the promised land? God says by honoring your parents, by following after them as they follow after me. The promise of the fifth commandment is this sober warning, or maybe not to put it that way, this promise that for the godly parents who lead their children, the covenant children were to follow after them and learn what it is to walk in righteousness as their parents follow after Christ. And in many ways, there's numerous passages we could turn to over and over in the Old Testament. God instructs parents to teach their children. 
I think, for example, of Deuteronomy 6, probably the clearest passage where God says to parents, listen, I'm about to give you the promised land, and I'm concerned that when you get all of these homes you did not build, when you get water from wells that you did not dig, I'm afraid that you're going to forget me. So what are you to do, and what are you to do with your children? You're to teach them about me. You're to open the Word and instruct your children. You're to walk before me in such a way that you teach your children my ways. Here's the point, or here's the question we need to ask. How does honoring parents keep children in the land before God? It is presumed here, the commandment presumes that godly parents are teaching their covenant children the godly ways of following after their holy God. In fact, this past week, I listened to a new sermon that I hadn't listened to by an OPC minister named Reverend Eric Watkins. It was a fantastic sermon. And uh, he noted in that sermon that this whole commandment presumes blessing from godly parents. Because the promise is only true if parents are teaching their children godliness. In Deuteronomy 6, God says, parents, you are to instruct your children in the Word. It's to the extreme. God says you're to write it on the doorposts of your home. It's to be written on the gates that as you children walk out, they see my Word. It's to be written on your foreheads. God is basically saying my Word is to be everywhere, always before your children. And in in Deuteronomy 6, God says, when are you to speak with your children? It's every moment of every day. When you wake up in the morning, you're you're teaching your children about God. When you walk about the day with your children, you're speaking about God. When you put them to bed at night, you are to be speaking, instructing them in the ways of God. And so you see, the fifth commandment actually has more to say to parents this evening than in many ways it has to say to children. And we think about it, we just read from Ephesians 6, isn't it remarkable that Paul puts a proper New Testament application? It's not to the land of Palestine anymore that the fifth commandment holds promise, but did you catch what Paul did, the fifth commandment? He says, the blessing to you is that you will live long in the land, the earth. What was Paul saying? To children who obey their parents and follow after godliness, what's the promise? That they will inherit this earth. What is this earth? the new heavens and the new earth that Christ is going to give to those his people. See, the promise was not to a a small plot of land in Palestine. The ultimate promise is the new heavens and the new earth. Where does the blessing come? It's when godly parents open the word and instruct their children so that their children learn to follow after God so that they inherit the everlasting blessings of the new heavens and the new earth. You know, one of the things that uh, Reverend Watkins did in that sermon is that he read from two passages in the Old Testament to startle the children awake, two passages where children uh, were warned that if they were persistent and disobedient, they were to be put to death. And uh, he properly noted that that, of course, thankfully, is no longer to be applied today, but what's the point? God says in the Old Testament, disobedience is so serious because if you disobey your parents, the consequence is not just temporal death, it's everlasting death. And then for parents or to children, you are to take very serious obedience because godly parents are the greatest blessing because they are leading you by guides unto everlasting life. And you see, that's where the great blessing comes in. As God writes in this law to covenant parents, to covenant children, he says, children, follow your parents, obey them, honor them, because they are teaching you the greatest path ever, the path to everlasting life. And so, in conclusion tonight, what are we to make by our own personal application? And there are two things that I just want to leave you with tonight. First of all, we see the great need for the gospel in the fifth commandment. We see the great need for this because you and I have broken this law by our disobedience, our lack of respect, our lack of honor both to our own parents and to lawful authorities over us. And if in the Old Testament God warned children by the threat of death for if they persisted in rebellion, we are reminded tonight that teaches us that you and I, if God were to give us what we deserve for how we have rebelled against authority, we should die. And you see, that's why Christ needed to die. On the cross of Calvary, Christ gave up his life for people like you and I who have rebelled against authority, dishonored authority. And what's remarkable is that he is the one who always obeyed authority. He always honored his parents. He always submitted to the authorities in his day. So why did Jesus die? He died for his people 
He died for our breaking of the fifth commandment tonight. Christian, tonight, that's the good news of the gospel. We need not fear the terror of the consequence of death because Christ has done that. He who is the sinless son who perfectly obeyed the commandment paved the way for us who by faith and repentance are forgiven from this. And there's the good news of the gospel tonight. We are freed from the condemnation of this law because of Christ and what he has done. But the second thing that I would say tonight in conclusion, and this is, of course, where I want to really emphasize tonight. Tonight we learned from the fifth commandment that godly parents are a gift to covenant children. Now, children present here tonight, do you view your parents as a gift? You should. It is a tremendous gift that from infancy on, your parents are teaching you the way of everlasting life. Godly parents are the greatest treasure and gift that God has given you tonight as covenant children. Children, you and I, as our parents, you and I are called to be gifts to our children. And to the children present here tonight, your parents are gifts to you, preventing you from the pain and the circumstances of this life. Again, if I can quote or point to Reverend Watkins one more time in his sermon, he noted that in his study of culture in the 60s, there was a dramatic shift in our American culture. You know, prior to that, you know, parents of, or children, I guess, always struggled with disobedience to parents. But in the 60s, there was a radical shift to where we were to rebel against authority. That, that parents now were the bad guys, that authority was the bad guys. And then from the, from the 60s on, our culture has been all about rebellion. And, and spurning authority. And he says, this has crept into the church and our culture has spun completely out of control because from the 60s on, we've been taught that it is our job to rebel against authority. Children, we've been taught that we must sow wild oats. We must do that. Well, that is a lie from the pit of hell. We've been called in the fifth commandment that we find blessing by honoring and obeying godly parents in the Lord. You know what? Let's make some... Or, I suppose we can apply it this way. Today, culture tells children that parents are the bad guys and they just don't understand you. And therefore, you need to seek advice and counsel from people outside the home because your parents are just fuddy-duddies and don't get it. It has gotten to the point today where our culture in the schools are telling children, do not talk to your parents because you need to decide what gender you are. We're living in a day and age where in the schools, apart from parental authority, we're teaching children they can decide their other things like cats and dogs. Where did this come from? This idea that parents are fools and don't know what they're talking about and don't understand children. This is the pain and the consequences when we spurn the wisdom of godly parenting. Even in this day, we're tell, our culture tells children that true happiness is found in following your own way. What is the mantra today? Be true to yourself. If your parents don't like what you're doing, be true to yourself. I'm here to tell you from the word of God, that brings misery. Being true to your sinful self leads you down a path of, of, of away from blessing unto painful consequences. Why is the fifth commandment a blessing? Because our parents have lived longer than us and generally speaking, they know the wisdom of life, but even more than that, godly parents know the blessing of following after a God who loves you of a Savior who cares for you and the way He has structured this world and the only way to find blessing. Here's my word to covenant children here today. You are to thank your parents and view them as absolute gifts from God. They are guiding you through God's word, failing as though we do. We are weak, and even the catechism says we're to be patient with failures. I, as a father, know how, failing, failure, or how much of a failure I am. But by God's wondrous grace in our homes as we open the word for their children, our children are blessed, and may we as parents be that blessing to our children in this confused day and age. And may you as covenant children find that blessing as you follow after your parents who are following after Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our parents. We thank you for legitimate authority that is properly following your ways. Oh, Father, we pray, uh, we repent, we confess our our rebellious hearts that seek to spurn those lawful authorities. We ask, O oh Lord, humble us tonight. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would teach us from your word and that we would find the way of blessing and following your word. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.